family of Kirk Sterling started in the year 1815, in the days when solid silver was handmade. 22-year-old Samuel Kirk, fresh from a five-year apprenticeship in Philadelphia, came to Baltimore and opened a small silversmith shop. He made the usual knives, forks, and spoons, but soon was creating intricate tea services, such as this. Since Samuel Kirk had descended from 16th century English goldsmiths and silversmiths, his creative ability with silver came to him naturally. He first earned fame in 1824, when he made these two goblets for the great French general Lafayette. Then in 1828, Samuel Kirk introduced repoussé, an original design to silversmithing. These pictures are excellent examples of the richly ornamented repoussé design for which Kirk has been famous ever since. The craft traditions of Kirk silversmithing were passed on from father to son. This wine ewer, made by Henry Child Kirk in 1846, reveals how he excelled in the crafts of his father. That year, the business became known as Samuel Kirk and Son. Through the years, the business passed from one generation to the next in the Kirk family. The Victorian age was an era of large, elegant silver services. This punch bowl and candlesticks were part of a 48-piece service presented to the USS Maryland in 1906. It depicted in silver the history and progress of Maryland, county by county. In addition, each piece bears emblems of national, naval, and state significance such as this great state seal. Two years in the making, it remains a supreme example of hand-chased, hand-decorated, pictorial repoussé. This scene, showing surveyors laying out early Baltimore town, was but one of more than 200 scenic bas-reliefs included in the entire set. It is typical of the type of landscape in repoussé, favored by prominent families of that era, who frequently ordered silver services decorated with actual vistas from their estates. This coffee set is from a dinner service made for Thomas Fortune Ryan in 1911. He sent leaves, acorns, and bark from the beautiful English oak trees on his estate in Virginia. They were recreated in silver, then applied to various pieces with artistic originality. In 1925, a Kirk factory was erected from which Kirk Sterling has since been made. Individual skills and craftsmanship are just as important today as they were when Samuel Kirk first started. Sterling silver is made by adding a small quantity of copper to pure silver. The American legal standard is 75 parts copper to 925 parts silver. A brick of pure silver is placed in a crucible to melt. The ring-shaped cover holds in the heat, but allows copper and charcoal to be added. The copper and silver melt together while the charcoal forms an airtight film on top. The crucible is raised from the furnace into position for pouring into the mold. Kirk is one of the few silversmiths who still compound its own sterling. This crucible of molten silver contains over $20,000 worth of potential sterling flatware. That sheet of flame prevents oxidization while pouring into molds. Molds are opened to reveal solid sterling spoon bars, so named because they are used to manufacture teaspoons. These are numbered for identification, and a sample is drilled from every lot for analysis by a chemist, since the legal proportions of silver and copper must be carefully maintained. The spoon bars are fed into a mill. This rolling flattens the silver into longer and longer snake-like ribbons. After reaching the proper thickness, they're cut to teaspoon lengths called blanks. Each blank is cross-rolled, widened at one end as a start in shaping the spoon's bowl. Annealing keeps the silver workable. A rack of blanks is immersed in a hot salt bath in a special electric furnace. Since rolling has the effect of gradually hardening the metal, this heating or annealing restores the sterling's pliability. Removed from the salt solution, the blanks are cooled 
and washed in a rinsing tank. Then trimmed to a general spoon-like shape, ready to receive the pattern imprint. The pattern has previously been cut into a die by hand, and hand-cut dies produce the finest, delicate detail in the finished spoon or fork. This die sinker is an artist, working with hard steel instead of wood or clay. In an age of automation and assembly line manufacturing, Kirk Sterling requires the most exacting craftsmanship. This original Kirk design is then used to stamp the blanks. Each spoon, fork, or knife becomes a perfect, deeply cut impression of the die maker's art. Surplus silver is quickly trimmed away. Belting and the use of a fine abrasive make the spoon's edges mirror smooth. With a woolen buff at high speed, a polisher brings forth a brilliant finish, so admired in fine silver. Modern knife making is quite advanced from days of old. Today, the handles are stamped in two pieces so that both sides carry the design. These are spot welded, then permanently fused together by soldering. High quality stainless steel blades are secured into the handle so firmly, even boiling water is no hazard. Nothing is more dramatic than when silverware is wrought by hand. A single bar becomes a label, like the emergence of beauty when rough diamonds are cut. Carefully, the tip end is formed, and the bowl given depth and shape in a wooden pattern by precise hammering. Here, an experienced eye is necessary to form just the right shape. Then the handle is deftly curved and finished with a file. After polishing, the ladle is a jewel to behold. The first step in making silver hollowware is to trim away surface imperfections on solid sterling bricks called skillets. The skillets are rolled until they become flattened into silver sheets. Their thickness is checked with a micrometer. The sheets are cut to a workable size. For the making of a silver bowl, certainly one of the most fascinating sights in the Kirk shop, the disc is placed in a spinning lathe. It is held firmly against wooden or steel chucks, also called patterns. As the lathe revolves at high speed, the operator slowly presses the silver from the center to the outer edge until it is forced into the shape of the pattern beneath it. Great care must be exercised in controlling the metal so that it spreads evenly. The operator must place the spinning tool at different angles and must move the pin against which it rests accordingly. Having completed the body of this bowl, it is reversed in the lathe and placed in a hollow chuck of matching contour. Then by folding over the edge and pressing it tightly, a heavy, virtually solid rim is formed. The bowl is now ready for polishing. Fine silversmithing is the result of fine craftsmanship, for no machine can match the genius of a Kirk silversmith. With ordinary tools and extraordinary skills, the craftsman can create new pieces or match the old ones of generations ago. What began looking like a dish now emerges in the form of a bowl where the craftsman is making a teapot. This is the way all sterling silverware was made until the advent of power machines during the last century. Still, many Kirk pieces derive their individuality from this fine handwork. The artisan checks the accuracy of his work. Once he is satisfied, the top is scribed to duplicate the model. And the excess trimmed away. Spout and cover are similarly made by hand. Then, silver in its most desirable form is ready to adorn your home. When silver is engraved, 
The design is cut into the metal. This demands utmost skill and accurate cutting. Here, Mayflower, the oldest of Kirk's engraved patterns, is used to decorate a coffee pot. Engraving is especially suited for decorating large trays and waiters. And where the novice would move the tool, the master craftsman swings the tray. Still, the bottom of one waiter takes many days to complete. Another famous Kirk way of decorating is hand-chased repousse. The artist silversmith first draws the design directly on the silver. Then follows his sketch, hammering the design up from underneath. The French word for raising from beneath is repousse, hence the name of this famous Kirk pattern. Once the basic design is raised, hot pitch from southern pines is ladled into the pot. Upon cooling, it solidifies and reinforces the silver, which then can be chased. This hand chasing begins with a careful outline of each flower and wreath. Gradually, realistic details are made with a variety of tools, tools the chaser either makes himself or inherits. The chaser is really a sculptor with an individual style. Hand chasing lends itself perfectly to embellishing this little tray. Yet it is equally effective when worked into the border of a large waiter. Many days of chasing lie ahead before a piece this size will be finished. After the decoration is complete, the bottom of every waiter must be set, a process by which it is tightened and hardened through hours of hammering until it will remain absolutely flat, even under the weight of a heavy tea service. Pumice stoning, an age-old art, removes the marks of the planishing hammer and obtains a fine, even surface for the next polishing process. For a superior finish, inch-thick walrus hide from the Arctic, the only leather durable enough, is used with Italian pumice and oil to remove blemishes. Grease buffing creates yet a richer luster. A touch of rouge brings out the wonderful brilliance of sterling. Each piece is washed, then dried in clean sawdust made from special hardwoods. The weight of the sterling is so important that before wrapping, every Kirk piece is double-checked. Kirk has a variety of flatware patterns to please any taste. The oldest is Kirk King, first crafted in 1815 the forerunner of other early American designs, such as Calvert with its classic simplicity, and Winslow with its brightly cut border. Other examples of colonial Kirk flatware are Wadefield and Old Maryland, aristocratic in the traditions of the Free State. Also in this tradition, Old Maryland engraved, the most intricate of Kirk hand engraved patterns. Primrose, the most delicate of Kirk hand-engraved patterns. Mayflower, created in 1820, was inspired by a piece of silver brought to America by the Pilgrims. Skylark, Severn, Quadrille, Cynthia, or Cynthia Plain. Kirk makes patterns for every taste. Signet, modern in contour and individually styled with your own hand-engraved monogram which actually creates the pattern design, or with a delicate floral decoration called Kingsley. Also in the modern concept, Florentine, the queen of sterling, deeply hand engraved with a thousand tiny facets, possibly enhanced with your own monogram. In the finest of Kirk traditions, Cheryl, wild roses, sculptured in silver. Kirk Rose, the deep relief of chaste roses. Kirk introduced America's first flower and foliage design in 1828 with the incomparable repousse. Artistry in design, its richness harmonizing with any home decorative treatment. These are Kirk's present flatware patterns, but Kirk artists are ever at work imagining new designs, designs and styles of the future, 
as the artist strikes out boldly for new Kirk flatware patterns. Patterns with universal and lasting appeal. Since Kirk Sterling is now distributed the world over. As the artist's design takes form, he is inspired by the traditions of over 150 years in which Kirk Sterling has made live in silver the joy of marriage, the pride of parenthood, the attainment of a youthful goal. The list of noted Kirk patrons includes General Lafayette, Jerome Bonaparte, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, the Monroes, the Johnsons, the Roosevelts, the Astors, the White House, and many others. Perhaps this designer's vision will one day find itself in the homes of Kirk's worldwide patrons. An international favorite, Kirk satisfies every taste, contemporary or traditional. Repousse, for example, has perhaps what no other pattern can achieve, a grandeur for formal occasions, yet it is equally appropriate for everyday use. In fact, its best care is daily use. For Kirk is solid silver. You cannot wear it out. It is lifetime silver that is a lifelong joy.